Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast of in situ immune profiling of heart transplant biopsies, improves diagnostic accuracy and rejection risk stratification. Presented by Dr. Elliot Paster, a physician with the Advanced Heart Failure and Transplant Medicine Program at the University of Pennsylvania. My name is Bethany Vamnick, Global Application Scientist at Acquia Biosciences, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. Today's educational web seminar <clears throat> is brought to you by LabRoots and sponsored by us here at Acquia Biosciences. To learn more about Acquia and how our Phenoptics platform, which will be showcased in today's webinar, can support your multiplexing needs, please visit our website at www.acquiabio.com. Now let's get started. I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want during the presentation. To do so, simply type them into the Ask a Question box and click the Send button. Also, please note that you can share this webinar on your personal social media. Just click on the Social Sharing tab to let your friends and colleagues know about today's live event. Following Dr. Paster's presentation, we will have a live Q&A session where we will answer as many questions as time allows. This webinar will be recorded, so you and your colleagues will be able to view it on demand following its conclusion. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the support tab found at the top right of the presentation window, or report your problem by clicking on the ask a question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the continuing education credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. It now gives me great pleasure to introduce our presenter, Dr. Elliot Paster. Dr. Paster completed his medical training at Drexel University College of Medicine and went on to complete his residency in cardiovascular fellowship at the Hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. With scientific training in translational research and clinical training in advanced heart failure and transplant medicine, the goal of Dr. Paster's research aims to integrate automated morphologic analysis pipelines with molecular, genomic, and transcriptomic data to improve prediction and biological characterization of important patient outcomes. For a complete biography on Dr. Paster, please visit, visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. And now, Dr. Paster, you may begin your presentation. Thank you all for attending this uh, webinar. Uh, today, I'm gonna to be talking about uh, heart transplant medicine and how quantitative histopathology and in situ immune profiling are helping to modernize the field and improve patient care. By way of overview, I'll begin with some background on heart transplantation and allograft rejection, as well as a brief conceptual introduction to computational histologic analysis and some of our early results using these methods in heart transplant. I'll then present the results of recent work utilizing quantitative multiplex immunofluorescence, or QMIF, and how this computationally empowered approach may help address key unmet needs within post-transplant care. I know we have a diverse audience here, so in order to provide some context, I'll quickly review some background on heart transplantation, allograft rejection, and the limitations of conventional histologic rejection diagnosis. Heart transplantation is the treatment of choice for end-stage cardiomyopathy. And while outcomes are generally quite good, Vigilance is required to minimize uh, morbidity and mortality after transplantation. In particular, a primary focus of post-transplant care is the surveillance for and prevention of cardiac allograft rejection. Why is this a primary focus? Because rejection is common and because it can be deadly. Rejection occurs in 30 to 40% of patients in the first year. In terms of patient outcomes, acute rejection along with infections caused by immunosuppression medicines we use to prevent rejection represent the leading causes of uh, early post-transplant death. And in the later post-transplant period, a couple of years after transplant, the leading causes of death are sequelae of chronic rejection along with malignancies, which really are also a consequence of the immunosuppression medicines we use. In other words, post-transplant care is really all about immunosuppression, trying to use just enough to prevent rejection without going overboard and needlessly increasing the risk of infections and cancers. Uh, because of the frequency and morbidity of cardiac allograft rejection, intensive surveillance with endomyocardial biopsy has been endorsed by transplant guidelines for decades. 
as part of this surveillance, heart transplant recipients typically undergo 12 or more scheduled biopsies in their first year post-transplant alone. These biopsy procedures are uh, endovascular. They're basically just a long catheter inserted in the neck or in the leg, and um, a biotome is passed to the heart where four sort of one millimeter by one millimeter pieces of tissue are grabbed from the inner ventricular septum. Pretty routine, but also invasive. Um, Since 1990, the International Society for Heart and Lung Transplantation has issued formal guidelines for the histologic assessment and projection on biopsies which we obtain. Um, the ISHLT endorses qualitative histologic grading of HME stain slides for uh, basically assessing for the presence of inflammatory cell infiltrates, which are these little blue cells you can see there, as well as rough estimates of infiltrate extent and number and signs of vaguely defined myocyte damage or encroachment. You can see the grading criteria pretty much pulled from the guidelines themselves on the right of the screen in the table there. It's a four grade scale, zero R to three R, and a brief descriptions of what defines each one. You can put yourself in the position of someone trying to actually apply these criteria. You can probably appreciate that the vagaries and subjectivities of these descriptions uh, are a bit of a challenge. Um, sort of taking you into a few examples of grading in action, if you will, here are three examples of of different ISHLT grades. On the left, we have a 1R mild rejection case, in the middle, a 2R moderate rejection, and on the right, a 3R severe rejection. There are probably real, albeit subtle, differences in the number and density of little blue cells between these slides, and maybe even some difference in the degree of so called encroachment on demyocytes. But given the, the vagaries of the criteria, exactly where to draw the line of distinction between one grade and another is obviously going to end up being fairly subjective. As a result, it's really not surprising that when we take a look at the real-world performance of conventional ISHLT grading, we see that the field's diagnostic standard is far from a gold standard. In practice, ISHLT grading is neither reliable nor particularly accurate. The poor reliability in terms of inner grader agreement has been investigated for decades and really has been consistently found to be lacking. Overall pairwise agreement in the 60s is pretty common. Dismal agreement on the high grades of rejection, uh, which are the ones that tend to result in major treatment changes. And again, this has been found on every study for decades, including studies by my own research team. Um, the, when it comes to accuracy, uh, the grading criteria really fare a little better. Um, if we define accuracy as the ability of a test to identify the entity of actual clinical interest, uh, conventional grading is quite lacking. Uh, ISHLT grades correlate poorly with the actual clinical severity of an ongoing rejection event. This means that there's real discordance between histology and, and the patient's clinical presentation, and uh, it comes in really two flavors. Um, poor positive predictive value is highlighted by a case series data which shows that many asymptomatic patients with high-grade histology can experience benign clinical courses and resolution of that histology, even if they don't receive any actual rejection treatment. And then poor negative predictive value, which is highlighted by case series evidence showing that up to half of people who actually have a serious evident allograft injury with change in with heart failure symptoms and change in their echocardiogram, about half of them have sort of low-grade histology. So overall, accuracy is obviously limited here. Um, finally, uh, as if poor reliability and accuracy weren't enough, um, ISHLT grading also lacks the ability to stratify patients by future rejection risk. This represents a major barrier to personalized post-transplant management. Um, as you can probably imagine, um, these shortcomings of the current standard have significant effects on the practice of transplant medicine. Poor integrator agreement creates confusion and hinders multi-center research. Poor accuracy causes direct patient harm in many cases, with false positives, if you will, causing false alarm and overtreatment with dangerous immunosuppression, while false negatives re result in false reassurance and potentially delayed treatment of a potentially serious rejection syndrome. Um, and then finally, the inability to provide risk stratification causes a more indirect level of harm. With low-risk patients exposed to excessive biopsy procedures and excessive immunosuppression, which for what they need to manage their risk of rejection, while, while high-risk patients are exposed to potentially insufficient surveillance biopsies and uh, potentially dangerous premature weaning of immunosuppression. Uh, I think it's finally also worth noting, actually, that uh, the lack of a reliable and accurate gold standard for rejection has really held the field back more generally um, in terms of development and validation of newer technologies for rejection surveillance. 
it's been awfully hard for people to validate imaging and serologic tests when the, the standard of which they're comparing themselves is terrible. Um, you don't know how to interpret your results and it really becomes a muddled mess, which is why in large part, reject, uh, biopsy remains sort of the standard. So to summarize this little background section, rejection surveillance is a major part of post-transplant care. Current diagnostic standard is limited reliability, accuracy, and prognostic value, which affects both innovation and patient outcomes. Uh, and despite decades of research, no method has replaced morphologic analysis uh, as the diagnostic standard. It should be pretty clear then that there's an unmet need for tools capable of improving the diagnostic value of the biopsy tissues we get so frequently. So in the interest of being problem solvers and not just problem identifiers, my research team has chosen to utilize some co modern computational approaches in an attempt to bring objectivity and quantitation to traditionally subjective and qualitative discipline of histopathology. Um, Histology is a very old field, as you all probably know. And even something as seemingly modern as allograft rejection actually has morphologic characteristics that have been recognized for more than a century. Um, this is not to say that histology is outdated. It's just that uh, rather that the information contained within histology samples is of such obvious and evident importance that it was even apparent to people 100 years ago using sort of the most primitive tools of modern medicine. Um, this is pretty unsurprising. Histology is fundamentally the end product of molecular biology and, and a precursor of physiology, and as such should be expected to contain some pretty valuable information within it. The issue facing the transplant field has been how to maximize and standardize the extraction of this valuable information. Clearly, simplified qualitative H&E-based grading criteria have not been very satisfying. Um, while the human mind is a powerful piece of pattern recognition hardware, and while our pathologists, if any of you have worked with them or are them, uh, clearly see a great deal when they look at histology slides, they don't always see the same things or describe them the same way or ascribe to them the same degree of importance. So while Einstein probably said it better, the real problem is that conventional grading is the result of an oversimplification of expert knowledge. And it's this oversimplification that really comes at the expense of resolution. In the case of allograft rejection, I would argue, and I think many would, that the cost is simply too high. And it's in recognition of this tension between sophistication and standardization that our group turned to computational image analysis, an emerging technology that might just let us standardize and disseminate complex histologic information without losing some of those nuances and details that make it so valuable. Histopathology, as we've already sort of covered, is traditionally dominated by direct manual human analysis, but this really need not be the case in the 21st century. Over the past decade, uh, whole slide scanner technology has become pretty commonplace at almost every major hospital and many research labs, uh, enabling digital archiving of histology samples. While this was originally intended to facilitate a variety of telepathology workflows, uh, the value of this goes way beyond telemedicine. Um, fundamentally, these digital slides are not just pictures, they're pieces of data. A digital image is a matrix of numbers um, with position in the matrix corresponding to a pixel position in space and uh, the numerical values corresponding to pixel color and intensity. So if we can just deconvolute an image or picture back into these discrete quantified constituents, it becomes possible to perform a rigorous analysis of the data within it. This is really the domain of computer vision technology uh, and it's something that we're going to focus on, for the at least in part, for the rest of this talk. Basically and fundamentally, the purpose is to try and turn this histology image into this, a bunch of data. Um, and these days, it's possible to do this. Um, the advantages of such methods are pretty clear, I think. Uh, first of all, it can obviously bring objectivity and quantitation. It adds rigor, it adds reliability, and can certainly add predictive power. It also comes with several additional benefits, which are somewhat inherent to software approaches to diagnostics. Uh, these include easy dissemination, remote access potential, high throughput potential, the ability to self-improve as you feed it more data, uh, as well as the discovery of new biology when sort of unexpected predictive features pop out of models. And I think finally, of particular relevance to this talk, the potential to enhance predictive power by integrating it with other diagnostic data. This is going to be a the topic as we move forward here. Just uh, real quick to sort of, in light of these benefits, um, our group 
perform first in transplant work using computational histologic analysis. Um, the goal of this preliminary work was actually pretty simple. It was just to reproduce conventional ISHLP grades to show that we can to test out the tools in a new field and, 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 and to show their potential value to, honestly, what's often a skeptical clinical audience. Um, the idea being, at the very least, if we could reproduce ISHLT grades, we can at least uh, develop something that is more reliable than, you know, one pathologist compared to another that can at least attack the issue of, of intergrader agreement. Um, for this effort, we utilized a handcrafted feature engineering approach. You can quickly go through these images on the right of the screen here. What we did was basically start with simple segmentation of, of a piece of H&E histology in frame A uh, into three basic parts. Dark gray is myocytes, light gray is interstitium and stroma, and then white is all the non-myocyte nuclei. Those are usually lymphocytes, but not only. Um, once we had sort of basic segmentation, what we do is we use proximity graphing features to basically figure out which lymphocytes are sort of clustering closely to one another, start identifying these closely grouped lymphocytes. Um, and through some thresholding of when to lump these clusters together, split them apart, we were able to reproduce one of the key components of ISHLT grading, which is lymphocyte foci. They're not very well defined in the criteria, but they are key to differentiating 1R, 2R, and 3R. So we had to be able to reproduce it with our feature approach, and we did so. And then finally, we, we identified specific compartments of the tissue, uh, myocardium versus endocardium, and just to sort of better describe where lymphocyte activity is occurring. And when you put all of this together, the end result is promising in that it's indistinguishable from human pathologists. We were basically non-inferior in terms of integrator agreement and, and really looked like a, essentially another pathologist in the room. You couldn't tell the difference between our algorithm and, 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 a, and a dozen other pathologists. Um, and this proof of concept was, I think, nice, and it, it showed the power of the tools, but uh, it really only addresses this issue of reliability and does not touch on the issues of accuracy or risk stratification, which probably results in the most patient harm and patient issues. Um, we were obviously still just working within this ISHLT framework. We were just working with H&E, so really didn't have a lot of additional details. And again, we didn't focus on sort of the more actionable clinical issues, which is diagnostic accuracy and prediction. So in light of these limitations that we turn to the central experiment of this talk um, for uh, added detail and clarity. If a modern approach with computational histologic analysis was good, we figured that an even more modern approach using both computational analysis and modern molecular uh, diagnostics would be really good. Um, quantitative histologic analysis obviously does not need to be confined to just traditional H&E samples alone. Early on in the process of developing our preliminary algorithm and rejection, um, we recognized that uh, the power of these tools could be enhanced by adding layers of in situ molecular detail via immunostaining. A desire to explore these quantitative morphomolecular workflows, if you will, uh, led us to work with multiplex immunofluorescence in heart transplant tissues. When it comes to explaining the lack of agreement between histologic grading and clinical rejection, uh, the so-called lack of diagnostic accuracy that we already talked about, there are really several possible explanations. It could be just a matter of sampling error, and this is frequently cited by people um, looking at the wrong place. Or it could be a matter of timing, looking a little too early or a little too late to catch the disease process you expect. Um, I think fundamental to the research we're going to present here is the assertion that even if these issues of sampling or timing could have some impact, uh, we assert that the tissue itself still contains all the necessary information within it to assess the severity of an alloimmune response. It's just that manual H&E analysis doesn't provide enough mechanistic or immunologic details to get us to that diagnosis. Examine the, the biopsies on this slide for a second, and you see on the, the left half, the two slides, um, on H&E, it can be pretty obvious when there's a difference between the number of little blue cells, when you have a low-grade rejection and a high-grade rejection. It can be sometimes pretty obvious, lots more little blue cells in the, the, the right, or, right of the two frames there. Um, but when we sort of take a zoom-in look on, on discordant cases here, what we see is two, two, two slides, same histologic grade, but very different syndromes. The patient on the, the left, the third piece of the tissue in there, is, uh, was essentially still running three miles a day. Um, had a lot of little blue cells on their biopsy, but was running three miles a day, completely asymptomatic, showed up to clinic, felt fine. Patient on the right was in cardiogenic shock. Um, it's hard to appreciate the difference in those presentations 
just based on the little blue cell counting that is done in traditional H and E histologic analysis. And I think that's where we started getting curious about what pieces of information are we missing here. So the rationale for the work we're going to perform was pretty obvious. Obviously, there's the histologic side of it. There's also the fact that since 2004, the International Society of Heart and Lung Transplantation has actually recognized the problem with little blue cell counting and has advocated for further characterization of the nature of the inflammatory infiltrates on biopsies. It's just that in the intervening 15 years or so, uh, there's really been very limited application of tissue level immune phenotyping in heart transplant tissues. And this really stands in contrast to other fields, which uh, in the last couple of decades have had remarkable progress based on immunologic phenotyping with improved risk stratification, identification of therapeutic targets, and so on and so forth. Um, to be honest, transplant was being left in the dust a little bit here. Beyond the sort of call to action by bodies and success of others in other fields, there's obviously a strong biological rationale to perform some immune phenotyping as well. Um, traditionally, allograft rejection is thought of as a T-cell mediated process with recipient CD4 and CD8 cells reacting against donor alloantigens, infiltrating the donor organ, and then causing a bunch of damage. Um, this is why traditional grading focused on roughly estimating the extent of these little blue cells under the assumption that these little blue cells are all T lymphocytes and that all the cells, all the little blue cells there are there to cause trouble, to cause damage. Um, with pretty rapid advances in the field of immunology over the past couple of decades, I think this conceptual framework seems quite outdated. Even within sort of the simplified schematic on this slide, which just highlights a couple of key players in T cell biology, it should be clear that there's a lot more going on than just T cells are bad. Um, just to highlight a few of the active players here, because we're going to hear about them again, CD4 cells are activated by antigen-presenting cells, macrophages, dendritic cells, whoever it may be. Um, and these activated CD4 cells can do a variety of things other than just hurt your allograft. Um, they can differentiate into effector CD4 and CD8 cells, which can hurt your allograft. They can differentiate into, or they can cause the activation of naive CD8 cells, which can also hurt your allograft. But they can also differentiate into regulatory T cells, um, especially when stimulated with certain markers like PDL1, the checkpoint molecule. Um, and these regulatory T cells, in turn, can inhibit effector T cells, can stimulate PDL1 production in a variety of other tissues, both macrophages and your end organs. And this PDL1 expression, in turn, uh, beyond just helping the differentiation of CD4 cells, when it's expressed by end organ tissue, has the ability to essentially turn off effector T cells. Um, and that's why it's been such a popular target in, in immunology. But I, I bring all of this up just to show that there's a lot more going on than T cells bad. And in light of even a simplistic view of modern immunology, it seems clear that there might be value in better characterizing the pro and anti-inflammatory players affecting T lymphocytes. So that's exactly basically what we sought to do with this experiment. Uh, in the context of strong biological rationale and a clear unmet need, we embarked on this pilot work to uh, fully perform fully quantitative multiplex immunofluorescence uh, in, in heart transplant tissues. Um, we really approached two specific hypotheses here addressing the major clinical unmet needs we thought were most important and that we've already talked about. Um, the first was that QMIF could identify immune phenotypes that help resolve cases of clinical histologic discordance, uh, the so-called accuracy problem. And the second was that QMIF could identify differences in immune phenotypes between patients at high versus low risk of future serious rejection. This is the so-called prediction or risk stratification problem. Um, our study cohort consisted of 46 uh, transplant biopsies from the University of Pennsylvania between 2007 and 2013. The cases were selected to explore in situ immune phenotype differences between biopsies with, <clears throat> with low and high ISHLT grades, 0 and 1 R are low, with 2 R, 3 R high, between biopsies with, associated with clinically silent versus clinically evident rejection syndromes. This includes cases with clear discordance between the histologic grade and the clinical syndrome, as this is an area of particular clinical relevance. And finally, between biopsies from future rejection patients versus never rejection patients, as defined by having clinically evident rejection within the, the first three years post-transplant. 
the study flow diagram um, briefly outlines the core a little bit better. Briefly, of the, the slides passing QC, 22 were low grade and 11 were high grade biopsies. When we look at this cohort from the perspective of the patient level rejection syndrome instead of the grade, 23 were associated with clinically silent rejection, whereas 10 were associated with clinically evident rejection events. It should be noted that the cohort contains seven examples of overt clinical histologic discordance where either low grades were associated with serious rejection or high grades associated with completely benign reject, um, clinical courses without any evidence of rejection. Finally, of the 19 clinically silent low-grade cases on the far left there, not the bottom, um, these were uh, really broken into two potential groups, biopsies from patients who would go on to have a serious rejection event within the next six to nine months, and patients who would uh, never go on to develop a rejection event within the first three years. I mean, 13 never rejection patients and six future rejection patients. Um, in terms of the criteria we use to define clinically evident rejection, um, we use criteria modified from a variety of prior efforts in heart transplantation medicine. Um, briefly, patients must be admitted to the hospital, they must undergo rejection-directed therapy, and must meet either one major or two of the minor criteria here on this slide, which are derived from invasive hemodynamics, echocardiograms, EKGs, and clinical presentation. I won't read through all the criteria, but I'll give, while I give a few of you a chance to do so, I will say that these have now been used in several NIH grants. They've been sort of blessed by a variety of leaders in transplant across uh, the country. So they're, they're as good as criteria can be, I think. Um, with regards to our study method, the QMIF method, um, we deployed QMIF workflow uh, in order to perform in situ immune profiling on a bunch of archived clinical FFP tissue blocks. So just taking what was stored in our pathology archives and wax and, and seeing what we could get out of them. The custom-built seven-marker panel we used for the study um, was modified from existing CLIA-grade panels that had been validated in oncologic publications, and they included um, PAN T cell marker CD3, which, as we've already covered, has either pro- or anti-inflammatory effects, depending on the situation, a cytotoxic T cell marker CD8, which is predominantly pro-inflammatory, macrophage marker CD68, which can also have either pro- or anti-inflammatory effects, depending on the environment, um, regulatory T cells, with FOXP3 um, expression, which are predominantly anti-inflammatory, and then checkpoint system ligand PDL1, uh, which is a anti-inflammatory, anti-T-cell uh, checkpoint marker. Um, Akoya Biosciences led their considerable experience with these methods to enable the QMIF workflow in this study. All the staining was performed using their Opal Multiplex kits on a Leica Bond RX auto stainer. Slide scanning was performed with a Vectra Polaris uh, multispectral slide scanner. It's a really cool device. And uh, image quantitation was performed using some informed software. Um, after the introduction to computational histology we've already done, I'm going to spare you further discussion of such methods, but uh, the analytical workflow here should be relatively easy to digest. Starting with raw unmixed digital slides, pixel classification is performed to identify pixels associated with each marker fluorophore. And then cell identification is performed uh, via the DAPI nuclear stain. When you combine these workflows, you are able to essentially integrate pixel classes and register them with uh, cell markers, enabling single cell classification and quantitation. Um, more generally and more interestingly, quite frankly, for a lot of you, will be the, the why we do it. And when you just sort of look at the H&E slide at the bottom left of the screen here, and that cellular infiltrate, and it's all its little blue cells, and it looks like an infiltrate, and maybe it's affecting things, but when you put seven multiplex IF on it, you get a lot of information out. You look at the, the IF, zoom in on that, and, and you get the feeling that there's a lot of biology going on there that you're missing with just H&E. &E. And when you add a real quantitation to it, you can really start measuring that biology, and, and, and it should be pretty obvious why we were excited to try this out. Um, moving on to our study results, um, in total, nearly 200,000 cells were analyzed for this work. Um, CD3 positive cells were the most prevalent cell type, while FOXP3 cells were uh, the least prevalent. And then what was actually already a fairly novel finding, it appeared that PDL1 was pretty widely expressed in heart transplant tissue, which had never actually been clearly defined or documented, uh, at least in human samples. Um, Moving on to the more interesting results, however, um, when we look at the biopsies by ISHLT grade, 
Um, what we see is that there are dramatic differences in the more pro-inflammatory markers. Um, there's seven times more CD8 cells in high-grade biopsies. There's four times more CD3 cells in high-grade biopsies. And there's 2.5 times more CD68 cells in the high-grade biopsies. Um, when we look at sort of the more immune modulatory markers, the FOXP3 PDL1, we see really only more modest differences between low and high ISHLT grades. There's perhaps uh, a modest difference in FOXP3 cells approaching significance, although with multiple testing and borderline. Um, there's more overall PDL1 cells, but when we look at the PDL1 H score, which is a composite metric of prevalence and standing intensity, we see that they're really quite similar to low grade and the high grade. So what we really see when we look at these cases by grade is we see that high grade has a lot more pro-inflammatory CD3 cells. Um, and perhaps that's not that surprising um, as they were the most prevalent cells. Um, when we look at our results instead of with our sort of grade agnostic uh, point of view, which is based on the clinical rejection syndrome rather than the ISHLT grade, we see some pretty different findings that I think are, are worthy of more discussion than those ISHLT grade findings. Um, first of all, we see that the, the high grade biopsies, that the high grade biopsies and the clinically evident biopsies share one thing in clear common. Uh, they both have a lot more CD3 and CD8 cells. The high grade biopsies, more CD3, CD8. Uh, clinically evident biopsies, more CD3, CD8. It really gets more interesting when we look at the clinically silent biopsies, the, the ones that were from patients with no evidence of rejection at all. Um, when we look at these biopsies, we see, first of all, that silent rejection had, interestingly, twice as much CD68 macrophage staining as evident or serious rejection. This is interesting because when we looked at it by ISHLT grade, we saw that high-grade rejection at all the CD68 cells, and now it's the clinically silent cases that do. So this is somewhat discordant between grade and, and, and clinical rejection syndrome, and it's going to be worthy of further discussion in a moment. When we look at the immune modulators, um, we see also that when we break our cohort down by clinical syndrome, we see more dramatic differences in these immune modulators. Uh, Fox P3 cells, the Tregs, are twice as common in uh, clinically silent biopsies. And the, P and the checkpoint molecules, whether we look at it by H score or by prevalence, are much more common in clinically silent rejection. These are interesting findings and certainly suggest that uh, there may be important biology that goes unrecognized by traditional grading framework. We don't see much difference between these markers and traditional grades, but when we look at clinical syndromes, we see some biology coming out with these anti-inflammatory markers. Um, given that one of the major reasons to perform this work was to resolve these cases of longstanding clinical histologic discordance where the biopsy grade doesn't match the patient syndrome, um, it's really instructive to look at our study cohort by by uh, essentially contingency table designation. In other words, um, grade high, low, and syndrome, uh, and syndrome severe or not severe, silent or evident. Um, when we do it this way, we see some pretty interesting findings. First of all, traditional T cell markers, CD3 and CD8, do not help us resolve discordant cases. Um, you look here, whether the patient is clinically silent or clinically evident with their rejection syndrome, the two bars on the far right, they have much more CD3 and CD8 than patients with low histolo histologic grades. Um, and again, whether they're sick or not sick. Um, this makes sense um, since CD3 and CD8 cells were the most prevalent cell types in this study. And since traditional grading is all about sort of roughly estimating the number of little blue cells, it makes sense that high grade biopsies have lots of these, low grade biopsies have few of these. Um, but unfortunately, it also makes this rather unhelpful because what it clearly is not good at doing is telling who's sick and who's not sick. Sick low-grade biopsies look just like sick high-grade biopsies. They look like just like healthy low-grade biopsies with these markers, and sick high-grade biopsies look just like uh, well high-grade biopsies with these markers. When we look at the anti-inflammatory markers, PL1, FOXP3, and CD68, however, uh, we see that a pretty different story emerges. Um, when we look at clinically silent cases, regardless of their grade, we see that they have much more and similar amounts of PDL1 and FOXP3, the green and uh, gray bars here. Um, and again, this is interesting because these are very different in histologic grade, but very similar in these markers. And when we look at the clinically sick patients, the sort of little bars adjacent to each of those, um, whether the grade is high or low, they seem to have very similar amounts of PDL1 and FOXP3, and that's 
interesting because it really correlates with their rejection syndrome, not their grade. Um, one in other interesting finding here is the CD68 uh, markers, which are really only markedly elevated in the clinically silent high-grade discordant cases. Um, if you recall on the previous slide, we saw that CD68 was much higher in high grade, and then interestingly, much higher in clinically silent rejection um, when we broke it down by clinical syndrome. It seems pretty clear that the clinically silent uh, high grade rejection events are driving this phenomenon, um, bringing apparently five times as many macrophages to the cohorts uh, as any other group. Um, I think for those who, who like to, to see something to believe it, I think it's pretty instructive to actually look at the raw slides here as well. Um, first of all, and just sort of from a higher zoom out perspective, um, you look at the H&E Brightfield slides on the left, and the low grade slides look pretty similar, not a lot of little blue cells. The high grade slides look pretty similar, much more cellular infiltration. Um, but when we start looking at the, the QMIF data here, the raw data, what we see is that the high grade clinically silent biopsy at the top right looks very different from the high grade clin clinically serious rejection syndrome at the bottom right. We see a lot of sort of greens and yellows and reds, and we'll talk about what these markers are in a second, in the cellular infiltrate of the high-grade clinically silent case, whereas it's much less interesting than all things considered in the clinically uh, serious rejection high-grade case. When we look at the, the low-grade biopsies, um, we see that really bland immune, almost a lack of immunostaining in the low-grade clinically serious rejection event at the, the bottom sort of third column, bottom row. Um, whereas when we look at the low-grade clinically silent biopsy, we see a diffuse green staining that really makes it look sort of like the, at least the background pattern we see in the high-grade clinically silent case. We'll get to this in just a second here now to, to shed a little more light on what's going on. Um, when we look at uh, the unmixed slides now broken down by single marker channels, we start getting into the really more interesting findings. First of all, the clinically silent biopsies are represented by the first and third row. Um, so at the top, we have the, the top row, we have clinically silent, low grade. The second row is clinically evident, low grade. The third row is clinically silent, high grade. And the fourth row is clinically evident, high grade. Um, when we look at the, the slides corresponding to clinically silent rejection, uh, the CD68, PDL1, and FOXP3 channels here in red boxes, we see that uh, these clinically silent cases have a lot more CD68, a lot more PDL1, and a lot more FOXP3 relative to the clinically serious rejections. Um, when we look at the, the second row here in the green boxes, this is the low grade clinically evident rejection case, the so called false negative. Uh, we see an almost complete absence of macrophage, PDL1, and Treg signaling in this, in this piece of tissue, and it's pretty compelling for the loss of anti-inflammatory markers here. And then finally, when you, when you, when you look at the, the fourth row, which is the high-grade clinically evident case, um, while in the, the sort of third column, you see it's got plenty of CD8 cells, um, what you don't see as much of compared at least to the third row, which is high-grade but clinically silent, is you see much less PDL1, much less Fox P3 Treg, and, and relatively fewer macrophages as well. So again, what we're seeing here is that when we look at these immune modulators, what ultimately comes out of the equation is that anti-inflammatory markers, while not making up the bulk of cells present, um, seem to have a significant correlation with the clinical syndrome of the patient who the biopsy was obtained from. Moving on to, for a moment now, to on to rejection prediction instead of just rejection diagnosis. Um, if you recall, um, a subset of the study cohort uh, of the low-grade clinically silent biopsies in the study cohort were uh, taken from patients who either would or would not go on to develop a future rejection event. Um, in the table on the top right, the biopsies of never rejection patients have markedly higher levels of PDL1 and FOXP3 compared to the future rejection patients. Um, and what actually gets even more interesting is when you look at the, the, the graph below that. Um, when we break our future rejection patients up by the proximity of the biopsy to the actual rejection event, what we see is that greater than six months prior to rejection, they have modestly reduced PDL1 and FOXP3 levels compared to the never rejection patients. It's the, the second uh, group of columns in that graph. But when we go 
closer to the time of rejection, three to six weeks prior to rejection, the far right bars, we see an almost complete disappearance of FOXP3 and pd one signaling in these tissues. This suggests that these markers are not just somewhat predictive of, of, of outcomes and severity of rejection syndrome, but that they're also dynamic in the tissues and are, are biologically active over time. Um, to, to summarize this work, I think, I think we've discovered a number of sort of interesting things in this pilot research that are, that are worthy of both further consideration and further investigation. To summarize the findings generally, quantitative in situ immune phenotyping of biopsies is clearly feasible and I think also clearly adds some value to a rejection diagnosis, uh, although we haven't fully characterized just how much value. Um, in terms of diagnostic potential, pdl one expressing cells, regulatory T cells, and macrophages may help us discriminate between patients with serious versus silent rejection trajectories. In terms of risk stratification, pdl one and FOXP3 levels are dynamic and may help us risk stratify patients at increased short and long-term risk of serious rejection events. And finally, on a mechanistic level, it appears that pdl one and FOXP3 seem to impart some degree of alloprotective effect uh, on the, the tissues they inhabit. Uh, findings that are certainly worthy of further study and possibly and hopefully uh, worthy of therapeutic targeting someday. Um, like all work, this work has limitations. Um, like most pilot work, it has quite a few of them. Um, limitations here are obviously a small number of total patients in biopsy samples. This was pilot work, um, um, but positive pilot work and compelling pilot work. Um, the antibody panel is somewhat limited, so obviously, you know, a seven-marker multiplex panel is better than H&E, but it certainly isn't exhaustive in terms of all the potential markers of interest for immunologic processes going on in allograss. Um, and we also had a bit of a lack of co-expression phenotyping, at least in this deployment of QMIF, um, which is to say we didn't really try and figure out exactly what cells are these that are expressing pdl one um, for example, uh, are these macrophages, are these Tregs, are these myocytes? This information is going to be important, and we currently don't have it, but we will someday. Um, it's certainly a, a future direction for us is that type of co-expression phenotyping. In terms of future directions, obviously we want to expand the sample size. We want to do co-phenotyping. Um, we also want to expand the image analysis methods used. If you recall from our sort of preliminary work on the H&Es, we talked a lot about spatial relationships, infiltration patterns, density metrics, um, where lymphocytes were occurring. Uh, we didn't really perform that degree of overall image analysis and feature mapping in this work, but we can um, and we will um, because I expect if raw single cell quantitation is valuable uh, spatially, Spatially understanding that quantitation is going to be even more valuable. And then finally, um, pathomics approaches, deeper characterizations of these cell subtypes uh, through either RNA-seq or DNA or, 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 or barcoding or a variety of other sort of higher plex uh, applications to, to learn a bit more about some of the players in this tissue would all be, I think, of significant interest. Uh, conclusions and acknowledgments. We've covered a lot of ground here, and I hope that uh, you found most of it comprehensible and interesting. In terms of take-home points, um, on a general level, uh, I think this talk really focused on improving post-transplant care. It, it also talked about utilizing modern tools to maximally extract information from underutilized resources, and that's a lot of, of what sort of drew me to these methodologies. Yes, I'm a transplant doctor and interested in that, but I'm also interested in finding ways to make the most out of the, the data and the resources already obtained and already available to us. Um, histologic analysis is perhaps getting forgotten about in 21st century medicine a little bit. It, it's not some relic of a bygone era in medicine, in my opinion. There's a wealth of information contained within these histologic samples, and, and modern software approaches can really help us maximally get at that information and then to share it and ultimately to integrate it with the rest of the 21st century diagnostic toolkit. Heart transplantation medicine is a tissue-rich field with major unmet needs in tissue analysis, and it really makes it ideally suited for demonstrating the translational potential of some of these methods. Uh, I hope that the research covered in this presentation has helped to highlight some of this potential, and I thank you for your attention. A few acknowledgments real quick. Uh, my close research collaborators, Ken Margulies and Mike Feldman, the team at uh, Coya Biosciences, Bethany, Cliff, uh, and the rest of them for all of their help with this project, and uh, my programming team and our Dan and Sarah.
Uh, questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Pacer, for this very informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have any questions you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. So let's go ahead and get started. We certainly got quite a number of questions. So Dr. Paster, first up, what would account for FOXP3 decrease in the three to six weeks prior to transplant? Would you account that to stress or stress on the heart? Uh, good question. Um, I don't have a good answer for it. Um, it's certainly one of the questions raised by, I think, these results um, and one of those things that demand a, a further look given that we've sort of found it in relatively small and pilot data. Um, that's the question. Is, is the lack of FOXP3 driven by the start of an alloimmune process going the wrong way, differentiating towards a pro-inflammatory method? Is, is it you know, is it under immunosuppression resulting in this? Is it over immunosuppression actually suppressing FOXP3 differentiation? It's, it's hard to say. Um, more biological characterization is required, but I think that's, that's sort of one of those important actionable questions that data like this raise. Wonderful. Um, up next, another question. Uh, with PDL1 inhibitors in wide usage, and your results showing a strong link between PDL1 activity and heart damage, is there a concern that these medications should be dangerous to heart transplant patients? Um, so there's definitely case literature on this question. Um, the, it, in transplant patients, there's case reports, and multiple of them, of transplant patients receiving checkpoint inhibitors for uh, malignancies they develop post-transplant. And there are quite a few case reports of these patients developing a or acute rejection syndrome shortly after starting treatment. Um, there's also plenty of case literature on in non-transplant patients introduced to checkpoint molecules. These patients sometimes develop uh, rarely, but not that infrequently, autoimmune myocarditis. Um, so certainly it sounds like the, the checkpoint system is active in both native and transplant myocardium, and, and thus checkpoint inhibitors are, uh, should be used with, I would say, great caution in the post-transplant setting. Although obviously we don't have the strongest data to recommend this, it would be based on case series and these and this type of data, I think it's, it's reasonable to be very cautious. Absolutely. Um, up next, uh, it says that this presentation is dealing in particular with cellular rejection. Uh, what is your opinion on the interest of multiplex labeling for the knowledge of antibody-mediated rejection and help for diagnosis at biopsy? Uh, great question um, from, uh, from Patrick Bunival and, and friends who uh, I know also works with this platform at heart. And I think we're part of a small group using it. Um, it's an important question. So in this particular study, I can, I can say that none of the cases um, in the entire cohort met uh, current criteria for antibody-mediated rejection, either on H&E or on IF. Um, so, I do think we had a predominantly cellular-mediated rejection population here, at least as much as you can ever say that with the current definitions. Um, I think that it's highly useful for investigating AMR as well as uh, cellular rejection. I just haven't done the AMR work yet. It's, uh, it's in planning. In fact, we, it's, it's, it's part of an upcoming grant, uh, which, which recently got in front. We're going to investigate both cellular arm and, and humoral arm because it's Clearly, this was helpful or at least interesting and compelling in cellular rejection. I think the next step is look at antibody-mediated re rejection and expand numbers and, and, and really just try and, and understand the, as much as you can about the, the alloimmune environment. Uh, and, and that's going to require investigating both arms of the immune system, which are probably both active in most cases of rejection to some degree. Absolutely. Um, so I think this is an overarching question. Um, how do you envision results like these changing the medical care of heart transplant patients? Um, I think results like these are unfortunately not developed enough to change it yet, um, but they certainly um, get you tempted to think about how you might be able to deploy more personalized strategies in post-transplant care. Um, 
if you can identify a high-risk group of patients versus a low-risk group of patients. Uh, in that high-risk group, you may be able to surveil them more frequently. You may not wean their prednisone ever or at least not as quickly. Um, you may target higher tacrolimus levels. Uh, and on the other end of the spectrum, in the very low-risk population, um, you'd be able to wean their immunosuppression more quickly and limit their exposures to infectious risk and malignancy. And, and so I think it's really about uh, the right therapy for the right patient. And tools like this seem to get us closer to identifying who is the right and wrong patient for our kind of different approaches. Um, deployment in a, in, a, in a prospective trial will be needed, I think, to figure out exactly how to do this. But, um, but first, you have to develop the diagnostic tools that let you think it's possible. And, and this is, I think, a start of that. Fantastic. Um, so another question that we have is um, a kidney transplant biopsy multiplex study uh, using a Koya technology platform reported variable cell type infiltration. So macrophage dominant versus T cell dominant. Um, and once again, this is in uh, renal uh, transplant samples. Um, did you see any patient to patient variation of immune cell type in heart transplant biopsies? Uh, absolutely. So I, that, that recent paper um, came out right around the same time as this paper came out. Um, so we, we all, you know, there's, a, like I said, a small group of us in the transplant space uh, who have sort of been thinking about this. And, and, and it's, uh, yes, first of all, we do see variation patient to patient, actually a fair amount of variation patient to patient. And that's uh, important to take in the context of this work with our small N and a lot of variation patient to patient. Um, well, you need more N to really know what you're dealing with. That said, um, there's definitely, you know, yes, there's, there's patients who had a more macrophage predominant pattern and a more T cell dominant pattern in this study, because we decided to sort of jettison conventional grading and, and, and also introduce, um, a, a, a conceptual framework for looking at rejection, which is more based on a hard clinical endpoints, uh, overt allograft injury. Um, I think we were able to see that, yes, there's two different sort of dominant patterns of infiltrate, ones with more macrophages, ones with less. But what we also found was that the one with more macrophages seems to be doing better. Um, they seem to have, they seem to represent that sort of discordant high-grade subset. Um, and I think that's something that the, the kidney work did not look at, so I can't say whether this process is also true in their organ. Um, but in our organ, because we chose to look at sort of rejection, both histologically and by clinical syndrome, we were able to sort of tease out that not only do the infiltrates look different, but that maybe their fates also are quite different. And maybe the macrophages are either a late response to an ish, initial injury, which sort of interrupts a damaging process, or maybe it's just because the initial inflammatory response is more macrophage dense that it's less aggressive. Um, a little hard to say with just sort of the, the, the data we have so far, but I I think that uh, parsing out what these different infiltration patterns mean on a patient level is what our work supported, strongly supports doing going forward. And, and I think uh, hopefully when the, the kidney audience sees what we've done, they'll, they'll think about how to, how to look at it in a similar framework, too, to start teasing that out. Excellent. Um, so we have a ton of great questions. Um, we're going to roll into another one. Uh, how confident can you be that regional inconsistencies of endomyocardial biopsies do not account for some of the quite intriguing cellular infiltration versus clinical presentation, especially in view of the dynamics you suggested during the course of cardiac allograft rejection? Sure. Uh, a key question with basically all tissue sampling biopsy studies is, is how much is sampling error and sampling, uh, biasing your results? Um, it's a good question. Um, I can say, you know, it's one of, so first of all, it's one of the reasons why um, I think whole slide imaging and spatial features in addition to just raw cell quantification is going to be important. Um, when I sort of, when you, when you, and I'll, I'll drift back here for those who are still on the screen, when you look at, at the, the, the patterns of infiltration um, with, within the, the sort of different cell types, what you see is, in particular with the clinically silent cases, uh, the PDL1 signature, yes, it's focally targeted at the site of infiltrate, but it seems to also be somewhat diffusely spread throughout the tissue in the clinically silent cases. Um, I'm hopeful, although certainly can't prove yet, that, that's, that, that this suggests that there are diffuse processes less susceptible to sampling error, processes like broad 
general PD-L1 expression within the interstitium um, that may help you identify a high-risk group versus a low-risk group. So I think while, yes, infiltrates are spotty and patchy, perhaps the PD-L1 expression is not, and, and that's something which is going to be robust to sampling error. Um, not confirmed, but suspicious when you sort of look at the actual raw images here, um, and that's something that I'm quite interested in. Definitely more research to be had. Um, so let's go on to another question. Um, we will only really have time for maybe two more questions. Uh, so uh, don't be alarmed if we don't get to your question this time. We will address it in a follow-up email to you, um, the individuals who <laughs> asked the questions. Um, so up next is um, seven marker multiplex immunofluorescence is clearly a powerful tool in the context of your explorations, but the immune system is quite complex. Have you given thought as to how you might probe the general immune cell type you identify like CD68 and CD4 in more detail to better tease out mechanisms and targets? Um, sure, I've given it thought. Um, it's, a, it's an important question because H and E gives you no biological resolution uh, to speak of in terms of the cell types. Certainly, seven marker IF gives you a lot more information, but certainly it doesn't give you every piece of information. Um, you know, there are subtypes of FOXP3 cells, there are subtypes of CD4, CD8, CD3 cells that are not fully characterized with work like this. There are subtypes of macrophages. All of these have potential implications, um, and I think once you start honing in on on broad patterns of which are well correlated with interesting clinical syndromes, that's when you then want to dive deeper into, into specific subsets of your tissue um, and, and do more, more detailed, deeper biological investigations of marker types. And so I think um, uh, there are quite a few DNA barcoding technologies out there which allow semi-spatial, high-plex, 40, 50, 100-plex quantification of proteins and RNA. And I think that's sort of, once you, once you have identified actionable patients and actionable tissue samples, that's where you, that's sort of the next step is to dive deeper into it in, in that way and, and really get as much information about the immune biology as you can to start figuring out hard mechanisms and targetable, targetable mechanisms. All right, we are just going to have one last question. Um, and this one seems to be more of a method question. Uh, how long did it take to run these markers? And were they run on the same tissue section or separate tissue sections? Right. Um, in terms of, of time, uh, my understanding is that um, basically you can run 30 slides overnight. So you can do most of what we did for this cohort in a day um, between the, the auto stainer and then, and then, and then scanning with the, the vector polaris, which is a fast process, which won't take long at all. Um, in terms of whether they were processed on uh, – Basically, what we did for this work was we, we took uh, residual FFP blocks out of our pathology archives and just cut a, a fresh, a fresh uh, glass slide um, for each biopsy. Um, so each patient biopsy event got one glass slide um, with however many uh, pieces of tissue they had in wax for that case, and one glass slide per patient sent uh, and, and then stained and scanned. So that's pretty much how the we did not do multiple sections per biopsy, um, although you certainly could. It didn't seem to be particularly necessary for this work to get and a, a pretty good preliminary data. All right. Um, well, that is it for the questions. So, so thank you again, Dr. Paster. Um, do you happen to have any final comments for the audience? Um, I think we covered a, a lot of data in the talk and then a lot of good questions afterwards. Uh, so I just want to thank you all for attending. Um, Fantastic. And uh, I, too, would also like to thank the audience for joining us today and for all of your fantastic questions. Um, any questions that we did not have time to address during this webinar will be addressed by the speaker uh, using the contact information you provided at the time of registration. Uh, we would once again like to thank Dr. Paster for giving us his time today to discuss his exciting research. We would also like to thank LabRoots and Akoya for underwriting today's educational webcast. As previously mentioned, this webcast will be viewable on demand following its conclusion. Uh, you will get an email from LabRoots alerting you when it's available for replay. We encourage you to share that email with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event.
Additionally, at the end of this webinar, you will be asked to complete a brief survey, after which you will be redirected to the Akoya Academy webpage, where you can find previously recorded webinars highlighting tips, tricks, and best practices to get the most out of our technology. This concludes the live webinar. Hope you all enjoy the rest of your day.